At the turn of the century, poor dirt farmers in Georgia were losing their land as they sunk further into debt. Southern business leaders thought industrializing the South, building factories and mills, would help create jobs. And they looked to the North to pay for those factories. They called their movement the New South. But this New South saw some painful changes. And in the case of Leo Frank and Mary Fagan, a double tragedy. It was a trial that shook the community in, in, in a lot of different ways, it shook the Jewish community especially. The whole case of Mary Fagan and Leo Frank was a tragedy, uh, but in focusing on those individuals, we lost sight of the broader issues that were involved at the time, the broader economic issues, the issues of change from a rural world to a more urban world. As factories and mills sprang up in urban areas, thousands upon thousands of rural Georgians flooded into cities like Atlanta, hoping to find work and relief from their poverty. But the reality they found was quite different from their dreams. The amount that you would make in a textile mill was just a little bit higher than what you would make as a sharecropper. And furthermore, it was a system that depended upon your whole family often going into the mill, and you really needed everybody in your family or a number of people in your family working in order to make any kind of living wage. To farmers who had spent their lives on the land, the New South seemed an alien world. Seemingly overnight, within a single generation, they found themselves living in urban slums and watched their children grow up inside factories. These were the conditions in Atlanta when Mary Fagan, a 13-year-old factory worker, was found brutally murdered in the basement of the National Pencil Factory in 1913. The manager of the factory was accused of murdering Mary Fagan. His name was Leo Frank. He was a northerner, and he was Jewish. And based solely upon the testimony of a janitor named Jim Conley, Leo Frank was convicted and given the death penalty. A mob, a crowd, would crowd the courthouse. The jurors would have to walk to the courthouse from their hotel through this mob, many of whom wanted Frank uh, to be found guilty. The public's cry for Frank's blood made the prosecutor's job easy. Although Jim Conley changed his story several times and had initially been a suspect himself, the jury needed little convincing that Leo Frank was the one who killed Mary Fagan. There's no such thing as child labor laws and um, unions and children. Mary Fagan was 13 and worked a long, long day for very little money. And he was seen by many as the Jewish man coming from the north to um, exploit these little girls. I think we often look for scapegoats, for convenient uh, targets that are easy, that are strange, that are different, that make ready convenient targets and we focus our attention upon them and they may or may not be ca causing our problems but it's very easy to find convenient scapegoats and Leo Frank was certainly a, a scapegoat. One man who was not convinced of Frank's guilt, who would not take the easy way out, was Georgia's governor, John Slayton. Based on evidence that he had heard that was not brought up in court, Slayton changed Frank's sentence from death to life in prison. And here he was the governor of Georgia, and he just was very, very well liked. He was a very popular governor. And by commuting or setting aside Leo's sentence, he did the honorable thing, but he destroyed his political career. Sparing Frank's life ignited public anger. On August 16, 1915, a group of men from Mary Fagan's hometown of Marietta kidnapped Leo Frank from the state penitentiary and hanged him. There was a circus atmosphere that morning. A popular musician wrote a song. People took pictures and sold memorabilia, a piece of the rope used to hang Frank, a leaf from the tree. But this was a lynching, the result of prejudice and blind hatred. Very quickly, both he and Mary Fagan became symbols for a lot of what was wrong with the New South. Mary Fagan, a symbol of young girls 
who had to go into the factory, who had to live in the city with all of its strange kinds of ways. And Leo Frank, a symbol of kind of an alien urban capitalism, uh, too. In the 1980s, there was new evidence showing that Jim Conley probably lied during the trial and that Leo Frank was, in fact, innocent. And so the state of Georgia officially pardoned him. Today, his story still haunts us, perhaps because in its retelling, there is a lesson too valuable to be lost. I think there are lots of times, and I think you can point to the present as one of those times when people sometimes think the world is changing too fast. And we latch upon symbols to vent our, our confusion, our frustration, our anger at, at things that are kind of out of our control. I think the Leo Frank case is a tragic example of the problems with that. In the 1920s, the Knights of Mary Fagan resurfaced in Georgia as the Ku Klux Klan. About Georgia's economic history, there are more stories to tell, so we'll be back. This is Georgia Stories 2. I'm Colin Sedor. Thanks.